MedCram. Welcome to another MedCram lecture. We're going to talk about chest x-rays today, how to interpret them, how to review them in a systematic way, and make sure that you get the interpretation correct. The first thing that we've got to review is how to interpret a chest x-ray. So an x-ray is simply a film that is looking at material hitting the film and causing it to either be dark or white. It's a black and white film. And that correlates to about five different areas of density. Okay? So everything's black and white. Going from black, this represents basically air. So things that are air density on the chest x-ray are going to appear black. Things that are dark gray is going to look like subcutaneous tissue or fat. Three, you'll kind of see light gray. And that's usually soft tissues like the heart, blood vessels, things of that nature. So soft tissue. Four is going to be just off-white. And this is going to be bone. So ribs, clavicle, things of that nature. And then finally, you're going to see bright white. And so this is things like metal, which is sometimes seen on chest x-rays, either because of pacemakers, defibrillators, or even buckshot from uh, gunshot wounds. So these are your five things that you're generally going to see. Now, because of these different densities, you're going to notice things on the chest x-ray if there's a difference in density by objects that are next to each other. For instance, if we've got object A sitting next to object B, the only way you're going to be able to see this line that separates them is if the density of B is of one of these five different densities and it is different than the density of A. Let's give an example of this here. Um, you've got the hemidiaphragm that sits at the bottom of the lungs. That hemidiaphragm is made out of muscle and right below it sits the liver both of which would be soft tissue and would be light gray. Okay, so that's soft tissue density. Well, right above that is the lung, and the lung is air density. And so because you have two objects right next to each other with different densities on this list, you're going to actually see that line very well. Now, if something were to happen in that lung, let's say there were a pneumonia, that pneumonia in that area is going to turn this air-dense lung into a water-dense lung. And so therefore, this demarcating line is going to disappear, and you're not going to see it on the x-ray. And so if you lose that line, you can say then that there is no demarcation there between the different densities. So you would call that a right lower lobe pneumonia. That's as an example. Now, there are many ways of going through this in a systematic way. One that was proposed by Tally and O'Connor at the uh, Trinity School of Medicine in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, that's just one of many examples. But let's go through a normal chest x-ray and kind of go through the ABCs of how this works. Okay, but before I do that, let me just go through a couple of basics. So if you've got a person standing which is usually the best way of doing a chest x-ray. There's two ways of doing it. You can either shoot the film from front to back, which is known as an AP, or from back to front, which is known as a PA, posterior anterior versus anterior posterior. And it's really all about where you put the board, the board that's collecting the x-rays. If the board is behind the patient, like this, that's called an AP. That's typically what you don't do in a portable x-ray when the patient is in the intensive care unit. When the patient's ambulatory, the board is going to go in front. Now the reason why it's better to have it in front is that the heart and those objects are going to be closest to the film. And that way 
you're going to get less artificial increase in size. You know that when you're playing hand puppets or puppet fingers with shadows against the wall, that the farther you move away from the wall, the bigger your hand shadow is going to be. And it's the same way with x-rays. The closer you are to that plate, the more truer and better focused you're going to be on getting the actual true size of that object. So in generally speaking, a PA film is probably the best. Now with a PA film, they usually do something called a lateral film as well, basically a side view. And so that way on an x-ray, you're only going to see two dimension. On a lateral film, you'll be able to actually make out three dimensions and you'll be able to see things behind the heart, for instance, where it'll just appear as though it's in the middle of the heart. On a lateral film, you'll actually be able to see it behind the heart and be able to localize better where that object is. So generally speaking, in a hospital, when a patient is sick, laying in a bed, you're just going to get one view, an AP view, which is susceptible to magnification of the heart and the vessels. In an outpatient setting where the patient's ambulatory, you're going to get a two view, PA and lateral, where you're not going to get magnification artificially, and you're going to be able to get a better view. Now, generally speaking, we like to have patients take a deep breath in when they shoot the film. That way we can accentuate and see very well all the different areas of the lungs. However, there's a couple of situations that you should know where you want to do a exhalation film. And that is when you're trying to look for a pneumothorax. And the reason for that is, is that's when it's going to make the pneumothorax or the pleural air to be greatest and most accentuated. Okay. The other reason why you might want to do that is if there is atelectasis or air trapping more specifically because that air trapping is going to be accentuated on exhalation because all of the air is out of the lung except for that area where air is not able to come out. So these are the two areas where I would do a film on exhalation rather than inhalation. With well, that being said, when you approach a chest x-ray, the thing that you really want to make sure is that you're looking at the right x-ray. Nothing is as worse as going through the whole process of looking at an x-ray only to realize that A, it's either the wrong patient, or B, it's from the wrong date. And once you've got that, then you can move on to the systematic review. Okay, so here is an x-ray for review. Notice that this little marker up here which says L on it is referring to the side of the patient. Remember that the right side of the screen is always the left side of the patient and vice versa. So the first thing that I like to do is I like to do A first. A is the trachea. I like to look for the trachea. As you can see, it comes down in this area right here. Okay, And then notice that it branches this way. And if you can make it out, you can see it branches this way and down like this. Now, looking at the trachea is important because you can tell if it's being shifted in one direction or the other. If it's being shifted in one direction or the other, that could mean the presence of a pleural effusion or atelectasis, pulling or pushing the trachea in one direction or the other. The other thing, too, is if the patient is intubated, I can see if the endotracheal tube is in that trachea as well. And we typically want that between three to five centimeters away from the carina, which is right there. So one example of this, for instance, if we had a lot of fluid on this side, either inside or outside the lung, let's say we had whiting out on one side of the lung. The question is, is that a pleural effusion or is that a complete atelectasis of the right lung? And the way you'd be able to tell is if this was a pleural effusion, a pleural effusion pushes. And so the trachea would be deviated to the opposite side. However, if it was atelectasis, atelectasis is a collapse of the lung. It would pull it towards the right side of the patient or the left side of the screen. Well, the next thing I like to look at is B or bone. So I like to look at and compare the bony structures, paying very close attention to sight, size, shape, shadows, and borders. You've got the clavicles right here. Okay, so you can look for any kind of fractures. 
you'll notice here there's like a cacophony of ribs going by. The ones that are very horizontal are the posterior aspect of the ribs, and then you'll see ones in the front that are coming down. These are the anterior portions, and you can see if those are fractured or not. Um, this one right up here at the top, you can see here right above, the clavicle is uh, related to the first rib. You see the second ribs here as well. You can also look at the spinous processes and see if they're lined up all the way down. And you can look along the edge and see if there's any compression fractures. So these regular intervals will be disturbed if there's any compression fractures. So you can look at those as well. The other thing you can look at is for lytic lesions in the bone. I don't see any here. This is a normal x-ray, but sometimes you can find lytic lesions. And these are, look like basically holes in the bone. They're lytic lesions, so they have air density inside of bone density. Sometimes you can find some extra cervical ribs, which are a little bit off of this, but you wouldn't be able to see that here. So that's B for bone. So we've covered A and B. Join us for the next video where we talk about cardiac, which is C. Thanks for joining us.